Happy Wednesday, everyone, and thank you for joining me for episode 41 of the Southern Conservative Podcast. My name is Ty. Boy, do we have some interesting things to talk about today. Let's first tackle the shooting that took place at YouTube in San Bruno, California. When you think of mass shootings, what comes to mind? Assault rifles. Well, that's how the media portrays it. You know, any weapon can become an assault weapon when you use it to assault somebody. But we think of semi-automatic weapons, the likes of which were used in Parkland, Florida, and in Las Vegas. By the way, the shooting last October in Vegas is still a big mystery. With these shootings, we find out all sorts of information about the shooters in just the first few days following the shootings. There's still so much we don't know about the Vegas shooter. But anyway, in mass shootings, you think of semi-automatic weapons, you think of people who have mental illness, you think of the stereotypical mass shooter as being a white male. Well, all of that has been turned on its head with the YouTube shooting. Here you have a woman, Nassim Ogdom, of Iranian heritage living in San Diego, who had a YouTube channel just like this channel on YouTube. She was upset that YouTube had demonetized her videos. If you have a really popular channel on YouTube, you can get compensated for the views on your channel. You can opt to have ads play before and during your videos. Well, YouTube had demonetized her videos. So she goes to YouTube with a pistol and shoots a few people before killing herself. This definitely does not fit the usual narrative of a mass shooting. Now this shooting took place on Tuesday, and as it turns out, she had a run-in with the police and her family had warned police that she was angry with YouTube and she was heading to Northern California to YouTube headquarters. She was spotted by police sleeping in a car at 2 in the morning in a parking lot in Mountain View, California, about 20 miles south of San Bruno. This after she had been reported missing for several days. After she was spotted by police, her father said he warned them she was angry with YouTube. Her brother had warned police after discovering how close Mountain View is to the YouTube headquarters, and that there was a reason why she was all the way up there from San Diego. The cops supposedly told the brother that they would keep an eye on her. Doesn't this remind you of the Broward County Sheriff's Office? You know, we're all told if you see something, say something. Well, what good is this if people that we're supposed to tell don't do anything about it? It's just amazing. Now, the irony in all of this is that YouTube recently announced they were cracking down on gun videos posted to their website, including videos of gun demonstrations. So a company that is taking a stance against guns and taking down certain videos of guns winds up having somebody come to their headquarters with a gun and shoot up the place. Now our thoughts and prayers are with the victims in this shooting. Just some final thoughts on this. Besides the warnings made to police, she had posted on her website, which featured veganism and videos of animals being killed, that she was being unfairly compensated from YouTube. In fact, she had posted a comment that she was upset for only receiving 10 cents for a video that had 300,000 views. Despite the warnings, this woman was able to pull off a shooting at YouTube headquarters. It's definitely not the typical mass shooting story you hear about, that's for sure. Trump signed an order on Wednesday evening to put the National Guard on the border. This is something previous presidents have done in the past, including Bush and Obama. Now, the National Guard cannot be involved in apprehending illegal immigrants and doing all of the immigration police work, so to speak. But they can help assist Border Patrol agents. And having a stronger police presence on the border is what is needed right now, especially in light of reports of a caravan moving toward the southern border. The most recent reports tell us the caravan has broken up and it no longer is trying to reach the southern border. And I don't care what Mexico says, you know Trump's ordering of the National Guard and the strong messages Trump had about the border earlier in the week helped to put an end to this. But remember, we still have people coming to the United States illegally every day. The spotlight has been placed on this caravan, and that's a good thing, 
because it gets people engaged in the immigration issue and the problems we have with a porous southern border. And hopefully this will reinvigorate those on the right and those who supported Donald Trump to continue to support the president and to put pressure on Congress to ensure that our southern border is fixed and that we fix our broken immigration system. And until we have a border wall in place, we need to have a very strong military and police presence on the border. The president has been working with General Mattis to see if defense funding from the recent omnibus bill can be used to fund the border wall since the problem with the southern border clearly is a national defense problem. I happen to agree that a border wall on the southern border is vital to the national security of America, and defense funding should be used for the purpose of building a border wall. After all, the omnibus bill included more money than what had been originally requested from the Department of Defense. Why couldn't some of this money be used to build a border wall? Now, speaking of the omnibus bill, the president is still furious over the amount of spending and the lack of funding for the border wall. Reports say he has been in talks with House Majority Leader Kevin McCarthy about rescinding some of the spending from the omnibus bill. As part of a 1974 law called the Congressional Budget and Impound Control Act, the president can make a request to Congress to provide for a rescission of the omnibus bill detailing money the administration does not want to spend. And Congress only has 45 days to act on the president's request. And it only takes a simple majority to act on the president's request. And with just a 51 to 49 majority in the Senate, that means it's possible for the Senate to rescind some of the domestic spending. But the Republicans will have to stick together. If successful, this should help to dispel some of the anger being felt by conservative voters over the outrageous spending and the process by which the omnibus bill was passed. I hope the president follows through with a request to Congress, and hopefully Republicans will take the request seriously. It could go a long way to help preserve the Republican majority in the House in the 2018 midterms. I want to remind everyone to please check out my Facebook page. Go to facebook.com slash southernconservative. That's facebook.com slash southernconservative. There you will find links to conservative news articles on stories you may not hear about in the mainstream media. Plus, if you follow the news feed, you'll find links to the daily podcasts. Be sure to also subscribe to this YouTube channel. You'll be alerted each time a new podcast has been posted. New podcasts are posted daily, Monday through Thursday. And if you subscribe to the channel, please click on the notification bell so you're notified each time a podcast is posted. I want to end this podcast with some updates involving the Robert Mueller special counsel. Trump's attorneys have been told that Trump is not a target of Robert Mueller. He is only a subject in the investigation. Trump still says he is willing to talk to Robert Mueller. Now, folks, make no mistake about this. The whole point of the special counsel, the whole motive behind Robert Mueller and his selection of prosecutors who have donated to Democrats in the past, his selection of Andrew Weissman, who has very shady ethics as a prosecutor, is to get Donald Trump. And we've been saying all along that there is no collusion with Russia to overthrow the election in Trump's favor. And while it appears this part of the investigation is fizzling out, Mueller can always get Trump on a process crime. They can charge him with perjury. They could charge him with obstruction of justice. And you can get these charges when you sit down and talk with prosecutors. If Trump can't remember talking to somebody, and that person has already told Mueller and his prosecutors that he or she remembers speaking with the president, or if Mueller feels Trump isn't telling the truth, there you go. Process crimes. Perjury. Supposedly, Mueller is looking into actions of Trump and his associates after the election to see if there was obstruction of justice. It's already getting ridiculous at this point. The bottom line is, Trump should in no way talk to Robert Mueller. The special counsel has their sights set on Trump from the beginning, and they're not backing down. Believe me. Just because Trump is a subject doesn't mean he's out of the woods. A target is someone Mueller is going to charge and present evidence to a grand jury to get an indictment. A subject is someone who can be charged if additional evidence is found. 
so Trump's attorneys need to advise him not to speak with Mueller. Now, look at the people who have been charged by Mueller, people like Paul Manafort, Rick Gates, Michael Flynn. None of these men have been charged with collusion, which was the whole reason for appointing a special counsel. And remember, the special counsel was appointed by Rod Rosenstein after Jeff Sessions recused himself because Sessions had some conversations with Russians. He was pressured to recuse himself from this matter when he never really had to do so. And it's a shame because all of this could have been prevented. When a special counsel was appointed, the special counsel is to be tasked with investigating some sort of crime that has been committed, or if you think a crime has been committed. The special counsel was appointed by Rod Rosenstein on May 17, 2017, without any clear authorization given to Robert Mueller. Now, I posted a link to a Fox News article on my Facebook page that everybody should read, and that's because the article is incomplete, and I'm going to fill in other details for you. Paul Manafort's lawyers have been arguing the special counsel overstepped its bounds by charging Manafort with crimes that have nothing to do with Russian collusion and activities surrounding the 2016 election. The charges stem from possible money laundering for consultant work Manafort did on behalf of Ukrainian politicians. Now we know why there are charges brought up against Manafort. It's all in an effort to get him to talk about Trump. That's because Manafort was Trump's campaign manager for a brief period back during the primary season in 2016. Court documents filed on Monday show Manafort's lawyers arguing that Robert Mueller did not have authorization to investigate these matters. Well, a memo dated August 2, 2017, shows that Rod Rosenstein had given Mueller authorization to investigate whether Mueller had colluded with Russians to interfere in the 2016 election and to investigate any payments Manafort received from the Ukrainian government during the time he was doing consultant work for the Ukrainian president. Now, there are two problems with this that the article I posted does not address and I'll provide a link to the article in the description box of this video so you can read it. The first problem is the date of the memo. The memo is dated August 2, 2017. That was the day Rosenstein gave authorization to the special counsel to go after Manafort. This authorization came one week after the FBI raided Manafort's condo in the early morning hours of July 26, 2017. In other words, the FBI armed with a warrant, searched Manafort's condo one week before the deputy attorney general gave the special counsel permission to go after Manafort. Rosenstein wrote the memo a week after the raid. You can't do that. What's even more troubling is the court supposedly felt that Manafort's lawyers were wasting the court's time trying to claim improper conduct by the special counsel. Are you kidding me? Clearly, Mueller had been going after Manafort for some time in order to secure a warrant to search Manafort's condo. And yet, authorization to investigate Manafort comes one week after the FBI raid. I listened to Rush Limbaugh's radio program on Wednesday, and he likened this to police searching a drug dealer's home without a warrant, and then the court later saying it would have issued a warrant anyway if police would have come to the court beforehand. You can't do that legally. That's a royal CYA right there. Well, the same thing applies to this. Manafort's lawyers should be infuriated. But there's a second problem to all of this. Manafort's lawyers are also arguing that Rosenstein does not have the authority to tell Mueller to investigate Manafort on the matters not relating to Russian collusion. Here's the legal logic behind this. Stay with me on this one. Jeff Sessions, the attorney general, recused himself from the investigation into Trump-Russia collusion and turned over the responsibility of overseeing this aspect of the investigation to Rod Rosenstein. Sessions did not recuse himself from being attorney general, just on matters relating to Trump-Russia collusion. The DOJ oversees the special counsel. Rod Rosenstein appointed the special counsel, but remember, Jeff Sessions is still the attorney general heading up the DOJ. On matters of Russian collusion, the responsibility rests with Rosenstein. So Rosenstein writing a memo that gives Robert Mueller the power to investigate Manafort for possible Russian collusion would be perfectly fine to do. 
except we know Mueller was already looking at Manafort before he had authorization to do so. But put that aside for now. What has Manafort been charged with? It's not collusion. It's about money laundering and failing to register as a foreign agent, among other things, but no charges of collusion. The question is whether Rosenstein can authorize Mueller to investigate matters other than Russian collusion. Because authorization must come from the Attorney General, and he recused himself on matters of Russian collusion. He did not recuse himself over matters of money laundering, whether Manafort received payments from the Ukrainian government, and whether he failed to register as a foreign agent. Authorization for Mueller to investigate all of this would have to come from Jeff Sessions. In other words, the argument is that Rosenstein did not have the authority to authorize Mueller to investigate Manafort on matters not involving Russian collusion. And to me, it sounds like a solid argument. So not only did Rosenstein's memo come after the fact, but the Deputy Attorney General allowed Mueller to investigate matters that Rosenstein did not have the authority to permit. Folks, when you combine this with the fact that Rosenstein went to Paul Ryan and begged him to withdraw the subpoena of documents related to the FISA warrants against Carter Page, and the fact that Rosenstein authorized one of those warrants, this man needs to be investigated and should be removed as the Deputy Attorney General. The problem is, Trump can't fire him because it would be political suicide, seeing as how Rosenstein is the one who appointed the special counsel to investigate Donald Trump. The special counsel investigation has gotten way out of hand here, but I do believe the American people are starting to see through this sham, and there will not be charges of collusion because there is no evidence of collusion, because there was no collusion in the first place. In fact, Rosenstein already told us that the special counsel has concluded that no American knowingly participated with Russians to interfere in the 2016 election. This came when Rosenstein announced the indictments against 13 Russian individuals and three Russian companies. That should have been the end to the investigation right there. Anyway, that's it for today's podcast. Look forward to another podcast coming out either late Thursday or early Friday. Have a great day, everybody.